All right, good evening. We're gonna ask that you come on in uh, to the room, come on in. Uh, we see the uh, participant count uh, going up. I uh, will get started here in just a moment. We're very thankful for our distinguished panel of guests uh, this evening. All right, <clears throat> give just another minute. Looks like uh, we still got some numbers ticking up here. All right, <clears throat> good evening and thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, we are here uh, tonight uh, under the subject of the COVID vaccine in our community. We have a number of uh, distinguished panelists and uh, guests with us tonight. Uh, so I'd like to start off uh, the evening by introducing our, our panelists uh, for tonight's session. Uh, first off, wanted to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Uh, Tara Lynn Cole, who is, uh, who's with us. Uh, Dr. Cole is an infectious disease expert. So we are definitely indeed glad to have her with us tonight. Uh, also on the line uh, in the webinar tonight is Dr. Sadika Kendi. And I hope I pronounced that name correctly and didn't butcher it too bad. So I apologize in advance. Uh, Doctor, <laughs> all right. Dr. Kendi is a pediatrician, pediatrics, uh, with the Boston, uh, if I recall, Boston uh, University uh, Medical Center. Um, also, uh, we have a uh, Dr. Mia Lane, who is uh, with us as well. Uh, Dr. Lane has just opened up her own uh, OBGYN clinic uh, in the uh, city of Chicago. Uh, so we're thankful, yay, to have her all with us, um, a graduate of Meharry uh, Medical Center, amen, medical uh, school, and of course, uh, Dr. Uh, Werner Thornton. Uh, we are so thankful uh, to have you with us as well, Dr. Thornton. And uh, we do have one additional guest, uh, Dr. Tony Hampton from Advocate Aurora Health, and uh, he will join us uh, as he is able uh, I'm quite certain that as a physician, uh, he has quite a bit going on. So we are indeed thankful for all of our doctors for joining us tonight for this webinar and this very important topic to our community. Would also like to take an opportunity uh, to uh, introduce my colleagues uh, who are on with us as well. Uh, the Reverend Dr. Tracy Gibson, uh, the Reverend Dr. Reginald Blunt, and the soon to be Reverend Dr. John Robinson. Amen, amen. <clears throat> and uh, myself, uh, Reverend Marlon Brazier. So we will go ahead tonight and uh, get going uh, with our webinar uh, as uh, we wanna be respectful of everyone's time. And we've got some great questions uh, for these participants uh, on with us tonight. So that being said, I would like to uh, throw out this first question to our group of panelists. Um, in terms of 
if we could have one of you maybe share a little update for us on some of the latest medical information relative uh, to the vaccine. For example, some of the reported side effects uh, that people are now uh, seeing that might not have necessarily been reported during the, uh, the trial period. Um, are there additional vendors maybe working on the vaccine? We know that uh, one of the things we've heard in the media is that there are a number of different vendors working on the vaccines. Some of those uh, vaccines don't require two doses. Some require only one dose, et cetera. So uh, wondering if uh, one of you all might uh, be willing to uh, take on that first question and uh, kind of give us an update on where things are relative uh, to the COVID vaccine itself. And I think some of you are on mute, but uh, whoever would like to take that question first, maybe I'll, uh, maybe I can start with uh, Dr. Thornton, if you don't mind. <laughs> well, I think Dr. Cole, being our infectious diseases specialist, will probably be the best suited to answer all the research and development issues. Um, with respect to the vaccine, I've received both doses of the Pfizer vaccine, and I can speak personally as to personal side effects. The biggest issue I've had was a sore arm. I absolutely did not get any fevers, chills. Um, I, you know, some people have said they felt as though a Mack truck had run over them. I felt none of those side effects. Um, was not tired, no issues whatsoever. And I'm, I'm probably the senior physician on this panel with regard to age, and I do have a pre-existing condition. So again, I had no issues. Um, I do know that several other vaccines are being worked on. I know the Merck vaccine, I believe has been, and Dr. Cole can correct me if I'm incorrect, uh, has their trials have been abandoned because they have found that um, their trial of vaccine was not uh, showing the efficacy that was needed in order to present it for you know continued trials and for uh, assisting the public. Uh, the Moderna vaccine I do know um, is again a two dose vaccine, a little bit of a different interval in as much as the Pfizer vaccine, you have to be available within 21 days after the first vaccine to receive the second dose. I think Moderna is uh, three weeks, I mean, I'm sorry, four weeks, give or take. Um, and other than that, I know there's some other people, AstraZeneca, so forth and so on, a lot of different people uh, working it out, but I think, the, and Johnson and Johnson, of course, um, but I think since we're speaking to a mostly community of people of color, I'd just like to interject this. One of the reasons I'm really pro-vaccine is because so many of us have high-risk occupations. Um, and I've seen some questions come across the bottom with regard to should children receive it again. I'm, I'm an OBGYN, by the way, and I don't really practice obstetrics anymore, Dr. Lane. I'm, a, I'm, I'm now a gynecologist and I'm in rural America. I'm in rural uh, Duluth, Minnesota, having come from Atlanta. So it's a big change. But here's the big deal. Especially in colder climates, we are in close quarters, more so than people under isolation and quarantine, let's say in Atlanta or Miami or, or even DC. So people are coming to work, going to work rather, coming back home. And again, we are having multi-generational families. We're having parents with young kids, aunties, grandmothers, so forth and so on. And a lot of people in our communities are losing their housing have lost their jobs. So we are seeing more, if you can, for lack of a better word, bundling up of family members and family units. So again, I just wanna just throw out to the public, we really need to give this vaccine a serious amount of consideration for the health and well-being of our communities. And with that, I'll turn it over to my other members of the panel. Um, let, me, let me just kind of roll back. So in the United States, we have two vaccines, the one by Pfizer and one by Moderna. Both of them are messenger RNA vaccines, which is a, a relatively new um, technology and concept for human vaccines. And it allows um, for the production of them to become so much faster. So I know there's a, like a lot of hesitancy and people are concerned about the fact that this that they were made so quickly when they really weren't. So what happened was when the when the Chinese released the genetic code in the third week of January, I wanna say by the first week of February, they were already starting on um, vaccine studies. And then um, what we know is that 
the backbone of some of these was taken from vaccines that were developed 2003 and four for SARS, the original SARS, because mm -hmm. there's a relationship with that. But what happened was SARS died out and it's not come back. So there was never a completion of all the clinical trials for, for vaccines in that, in that order. And so what we do in science a lot of times is we just freeze stuff. So when this came up and everybody recognized it was another one of these coronaviruses that had jumped from uh, an animal species to people, they pulled that data out. And what they were able to do that added additional time saving was look at the safety data that was from all of those previous vaccines that were related to SARS. And they were able to make the adjustment of that. And then at the same time, uh, manufacturing was happening at parallel. So once they started working on vaccines, they, people who were working on manufacturing started at that time. We don't do that. Like the world does not do that because that's a waste. Most people think, well, that's a waste of money. And just like Dr. Thornton just mentioned about the Merck vaccine, how they've totally scrapped it. So that's money down, down the drain. But because it's the entire world is going through a pandemic and the whole idea of having vaccines is two very, very important things. One, we want you to get it because we people are dying and it's going to stop you from dying. And then the other thing that we know that I can say about all of these vaccines is that it prevents you from having severe symptoms and severe severe disease. Now, what we don't know yet is that if you if you get these vaccines, whether or not you will still get the virus, but you will be asymptomatic. We, we don't think that's happening. We don't have data for that yet. We will have data for that probably in about another month or so. And so the reason why we are still so pro masks and all of these things is because if you're still vaccinated and you have protection, the possibility that if you know somebody else can still get that virus from you and be asymptomatic and it can continue to pass along that way. But we will have data about that. Children were not included in any of these vaccine studies. And that's pretty normal. I mean, they don't start off with anything new in children. There are some children's trials that are sp were supposed to be starting um, in January. Uh, I think Pfizer, I don't know how they're doing yet, but I know they had started kind of enrolling. And, and then typically you do that like afterwards. The two vaccines that we are using in the United States um, mm. for, the, for the most part require um, storage components, uh, frozen storage. So there are a lot of logistical issues with this one, unlike some of these other ones that are coming up like Johnson & Johnson, which will probably in two weeks be applying for emergency use authorization. And by the way, because all of this is happening in real time, a lot of these things are streaming. So if you're interested in what the FDA is saying and when companies present their, their mm -hmm. vaccine data, because they have to present two, two months of, of mm -hmm. safety data, you can get online and you can watch them hash it out and, and all the subject matter experts you know, submit their concerns about you know, whether or not they think children 16 and older are adults or you know what the study says and in, in, in whether or not you can extend it to other people. Can it go beyond, can you wait do more than four weeks for one or more than three weeks for another? So you hear all of those conversations and you know, um, you're able to hear uh, because there are, there are clinicians all over the United States and the world who are having these conversations. So what will be coming up next is you'll be able to do that. After those things get the emergency use kind of authorization, then it goes to a committee within the CDC, which is they, are, um, they focus on immunization practices. And they are the people that came up with the priority lists, the ones that were saying that we think all healthcare you know, workers, uh, essential workers, people in nursing homes, that they should be in tier one and, and, and everything like that. So that would be the next kind of um, committee meeting that you will hear. And so the next one that you'll hear about that will be for Johnson & Johnson. We aren't using currently the um, the uh, the Oxford vaccine that they're using over there in England and in and in the UK they're doing something that we are not here. They are allowing all of their doses to go out. So say you got Pfizer for your first dose, and they may not have any more Pfizer, so they're allowing people to get Moderna. We're not doing any of that mixing and matching and swapping because the data just doesn't show it that way. And the FDA is not going to green light something like that. And I don't even think that Canada is doing that. Matter of fact, I know it. And the UK, why they are 
doing that without the data, I'm not certain. I don't know if that's necessarily going to be unsafe. It's just that when you are using something brand new like this, you really do try to stick hard to what the studies showed you. Um, and then everybody who's getting these vaccinations now, I mean, uh, you, there's a smart app that's called Be Safe, and they're checking on you almost every single day how your symptoms are doing. I think I just, if I can interject and just add um, some women's health perspective about the vaccine and something that we're talking about um, as of this past week is whether or not it's safe for pregnant women to get the, the COVID-19 mm -hmm. vaccine. And so the, the two governing bodies in the, the United States for pregnant women and OBGYNs are the American College of OBGYNs called ACOG and then the Society for Maternal Fetal Medicine. That's a society for high-risk pregnancy. So all of the high-risk pregnancy doctors are in that society, SMFM. Both of those organizations have stated that it's safe for pregnant women to get the COVID-19 vaccine. And pregnant women have been getting it. It's just that um, in the past week or so, the World Health Organization, uh, who um, released a statement stating that only pregnant women that are healthcare professionals should get the vaccine. We are still saying that it's safe because the evidence has proven that pregnant women can safely get the vaccine and there's no impact on them or their babies. Um, and so we just wanna make sure that message is very clear that pregnant women are getting the vaccine. They're not having adverse outcomes, just like anyone else that's getting the vaccine. And what we do know is that pregnant women, because their immune system is compromised due to the pregnancy, um, they're at higher risk for having bad outcomes if they do get COVID. And so the best recommendations for pregnant women to get the COVID-19 vaccine, it doesn't matter what profession you have. Mm -hmm. I'll just add as a pediatrician, I know one of the questions was about when the vaccine is approved for kids, should kids get it? And I would definitely recommend that, that children get the vaccine once it's approved. Um, those studies, I believe, are just starting um, in children. Our center is one of the centers that um, is doing uh, the study um, for one of the companies um, on how children fare with the vaccine. And I think once the vaccine is approved for children, once we know that it's safe, you know, children are um, a big carriers of the vaccine, I'm sorry, of the virus, in that while they might be asymptomatic, while they might have milder illness, they can still pass it on to other people. And there's a very small percentage of children who can get very sick from COVID-19. And so I think it's really important for us to protect our children um, and give the vaccine once it's approved for kids. Dr. Kendi, may I ask this too? Weren't the trials done on, it was pretty much 18 and older. So are we classifying adults now as 18 and up and anyone under 18 is not necessarily uh, someone who's been part of these studies. So it, the age really depends on what children's hospital you go to. I think, you know, different hospitals will think of uh, children as different ages, but I can tell you that the Pfizer vaccine is actually approved down to 16 now. The mm -hmm. emergency use authorization is down to 16. Um, and they are currently studying children down to 12 years of age. Um, Moderna, I believe is um, 18. Um, and then there's a, a UK study going on that is evaluating the vaccine in kids, I think over age five. So, um, but no studies in the United States going down that um, to kids that young just yet. And I uh, wanted to recognize, uh, thank you, Dr. Kendi and uh, Dr. Cole and Lane and Thornton. Wanted to recognize uh, Dr. Hampton. Uh, good to see you this evening, sir. And uh, the question that we had asked, and I think you were on uh, with us, is uh, just uh, some of the more recent information relative uh, to the uh, vaccine. And I know uh, from reading your bio, you've done a lot of work, uh, particularly in the uh, African-American community. Uh, so I wanted to ask if you maybe had any thoughts as well that you'd like to add uh, to uh, that question in terms of recent information you've seen. Well, uh, you know, I think the question related to, you know, what's going on with the vaccine is pretty obvious. I think what we're understanding is that the, the history of um, how people of color have been treated, um, it's coming to the forefront. So I think, you know, I, I was, you know, literally uh, trying to grab people and say, get the vaccine. And now I understand why. 
uh, people hesitate. So I think the message that I, I send to my colleagues and to anybody out there who's in a position to encourage a family member, be comfortable with the history first, rather it's, uh, you know, uh, James Sims and him doing experiments on black, black women. I didn't know this until recently, but black women were essentially treated like lab rats uh, for years, uh, having uh, like half the studies in the journals were done on African-American women uh, who were slaves and, and then even beyond that. So I think when I talk to patients now, I try to frame th things through that lens and say, well, I understand why there's hesitation. And then once I kind of share with them, I understand why, then I share with them some science to support this idea that there's um, the benefit of the vaccine is greater than the fears from the past. And we're, we have a lot of things in place uh, that help support. Not, not only do we have things in place, some of the scientists making the vaccine are people of color. And what mm -hmm. I found is that a lot of people of color are comfortable once they start to understand that there are people out there who have their best interests in mind. So, so I didn't want to over, you know, state, you know, restate what was stated, but that's, that's the angle I had to even learn myself personally, because uh, I didn't actually know all the history. And as I've learned it, I've uh, really tried to be careful how I talk to people. And I think that we just need more people of color who can give this message. That's why this panel is important. That's why we need more doctors and scientists of color so we can have confidence in the people who are sharing information. Thank well, you, doctor. Go given ahead. That we've opened the door around hesitation. Uh, can mm -hmm. we, I'd love to hear more from, from, from the others of you along these lines as well. Um, because, you know, the information is out there uh, as it relates to the Tuskegee experiments and, and previous um, other um, uh, experiments that were done. Um, and, and, and even to some, even with, to some African-Americans, it wasn't even that they didn't have knowledge that any of this stuff was, was being done to them. And so we have all of these uh, concerns out there uh, on a somewhat funny side, but I think they were also halfway serious you know, just watching too many movies and watching too many other things about folk turning into zombies after, uh, you know, after bad vaccinations and things of that nature. I heard one person mention, I am legend. And, and, oh, and, <laughs> and so just a lot of, just a lot of concerns because they don't have, because uh, uh, the previous administration truly mishandled uh, the communication and information sharing. What do you say to our community uh, uh, and let me say, I'm also extremely glad that all of you are here because particularly as we're speaking to black and brown communities, they need to hear from us related mm -hmm. to these issues. What do you say to our brothers and sisters who have genuine fears about whether or not they take the vaccine or not? Well, I'll be happy to just add to what um, Dr. Hampton had said is just that you know, there's the historical injustices. And I think we all know that racism still exists in medicine now. Um, and I think that that's the other, the other piece that we have to remember and that we, we need to continue to address because it's not just the history of the Tuskegee experiment and, and all of the other atrocities. It's also um, the, the disparate care that, you know, our black and brown patients receive at, at some medical centers and with some physicians. I mean, we've seen many examples of that with COVID-19 and with other things. And so I think in addition to addressing, you know, people being concerned about the vaccine, you know, us working together to do the work within our medical centers to make sure that patients are receiving the care that they need, that they are, that their voices are being heard. I mean, I think that that is just as important to show that we're not just pushing people to get the vaccine, but that we're also working on the inside, you know, to ensure that people yeah. are getting what they need. I would like to add to that as well. You know, this vaccine, as everyone has alluded to, has all the research has been done in the light, not in the dark. Uh, Tuskegee experiment, I'm originally from Birmingham, Alabama, and my grandmother's, as we called it back then, hairdresser, her father was a part of that experiment. And I, I've lived through people with secondary and tertiary syphilis in, in my city who were paid off by the government. We know that the army used uh, black GIs 
as experiments uh, with mustard gas to see its effect on black mm. skin. We can go on. Henrietta Lacks, uh, our other esteemed physician, talked about Dr. J. Marion Sims, who was the father of modern gynecology using slave women, one by the name of Lucy in particular, uh, as, as, a, as a subject. We can go on and on and on. But one of the things I think is really paramount to you know, speak to the public is that this has been done in the light. We didn't have to uncover COVID-19. We didn't have to uncover and go look for the research or the researchers. And as our former President Obama said once, you know, when, when white America catches a cold, black America gets pneumonia. And that's gonna be one of our main reasons we have to sit down and do some hard, fast thinking about self-preservation. Don't get caught up in the QAnon and the conspiracy theorists and the Dr. Sebi and all of these things I've seen. You know, you can do a hot chicken foot soup. You can drink alkaline water. You can go ahead and do certain fruits and vegetables and take zinc. And, you know, we can go on and on and on and make GNC and other people wealthy while all the time losing money and perishing. So, I mean, we have to, there are five reasons I want to just go ahead and say, why should we take the vaccine? One, so we don't get sick and perish. That's the paramount reason. Number two, why? Because we do it because we love our family members and our friends. We don't want to go around infecting them. We don't want to be infected when we're around them. So love your family, love your friends. Th three, we already have, and we know, of health disparity gaps. We have education gaps. Our children are not in school now. Our children don't have the benefit of tutors, and we a lot of times have blackouts in terms of the internet and web and, and you know, the tools necessary to do remote and distance learning. So we need to have these vaccines so that our teachers, hopefully in the future, our children can go to school and get ahead and get their education, because every day these kids are not in school and not learning puts them at not only a health disadvantage, but a future disadvantage because of a lack of consistent education. Another reason is we need to do it because we are also economically disadvantaged. We are the first to be laid off. We're the first to see our businesses close because of lack of capital to be able to provide for the safety measures for PPE, for our staff. We don't have so much restaurants that have outdoor dining. You know, we're usually mom and pop places with three or four tables. So we need to do it for our economic survival. We need to do it so that we can have our black businesses get back to work. Also, we are disproportionately uh, employed in high-risk professions. Um, grocery stores, Target, Walmart, medical assistance in nursing homes and in, and in hospitals, custodial duties. Yes, the faces you see here, we are Black physicians and we are high risk, but we cannot forget our brothers and sisters that are doing the hard work of having to go out every day to do uh, work that is high risk in a supporting cast. So we need to do that so we can keep our economics. Instead of waiting around for a stimulus check, we can get back to work and be healthy and safe doing it, going back home to our kids, our wives, and our families. And then lastly, for the young people, here's my last reason. If I can't appeal to you for any of the aforementioned reasons, do it so you can go back to the club. <laughs> so you can go back to the club. So you can go back to the park. So you can go back and do what you do. OK, I mean, that sounds rather simplistic and juvenile, but that's a real factor for a lot of people. You want to go back and do picnics. You want to go back in the spring, hang out, go date. You're tired of Zoom meetings. You're tired of, I don't know, what uh, black people meet or, or, or match.com. You want to get back and start seeing your friends, people. We want to have in-service religious services. We want to have our fundraisers, I mean, all of these things that are important to our community. So those are some of the reasons, like I said, this is not done in the dark. This has all been above board and our communities are hurting in not only the health aspect, but in all the other aspects that we always tend to be a hot behind and lag in every other sector compared to other ethnicities as well. The only thing I want to add really exactly. quick, just two seconds. Uh, when I'm when I'm talking to the masses, rather than doing a podcast or a video, I share a lot of those tips, right? But when I'm when when I'm with the face to face encounter, I just simply say to the patient, "Okay, we don't have a lot of time. It's a 15 
office, 15 minute office visit, just give me one or two reasons why you're afraid of the vaccine. And, and I'll try to dismiss that myth. So I think that if you take that approach, you can pretty much target the thing that people are afraid of. So one patient literally just today said, well, I don't wanna have a reaction. You know, I have allergies, blah, blah, blah. So I kind of gave my two cents about, well, we're gonna do it in a safe place. But then I show, I talked about data. I said, you know, probably no more than one out of 100,000 people are having anaphylactic reactions. And even those people, we treat and we help them. And by the way, if you get a penicillin shot, you basically got a one in 8,000 chance of having a reaction. So you have to put things in perspective, keep it simple, make it, you know, bite-sized pieces. And most people walk away from that office visit saying, you know what, that makes sense. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of leaning towards doing it now. I was just going to add that um, another way to to just express the safety and the importance of getting the vaccine is to lead by example. And so seeing the community mm -hmm. seeing that we're getting the vaccine, um, we've received the vaccine, I've received both doses. Um, and for my side effects, the biggest thing was just a sore arm at the injection site that lasted within 24 hours of the, the injection for both times, the first and the second dose. And so just allowing you to see that I'm just like you and I'm getting the vaccine. But like you said, Dr. Hampton, just acknowledging that we do have a distrusting past um, with the powers that be, so to say. And um, there's books about the injustices that have been done to black and brown communities, such as uh, the medical apartheid book that discusses all of those things that we were just talking about. And so we do recognize that there's distrust, um, but what we have to do is make informed decisions and not just uh, make decisions based out of fear. And so when we have informed decisions by listening to experts, um, listening to panels like this, I think we're able to make a better decision that we're all okay with and not feel forced to do something. That is a good segue, Dr. Lane, into um, the next segment, which I think part of uh, the facts and the information that you all have provided has been outstanding. Um, so I appreciate that, and I want to thank you all for, uh, for those contributions. One of the things that helps, I think, dispel uh, or maybe put at ease people's reservations uh, is personal testimony. So I thank uh, Dr. Lane for sharing your story, and Dr. Th uh, Thornton, uh, you already alluded to the fact that you have received the vaccine. Um, can the rest of the panelists share your experiences uh, with the vaccine? Um, specifically, and then if you can also kind of talk about your thought process as you prepared to receive the vaccination. I'm happy to start uh, with that. So I received the vaccine. I received the Pfizer vaccine. Um, and so um, I received two doses, 21 days apart. Um, in terms of my decision to get the vaccine, you know, I, I have to say, I I think because of the current administration and how quickly everything was approved, I also initially was a little bit nervous about it. Um, and so, you know, did my reading and kind of learned more about it. And Dr. Cole did a great job of kind of explaining and summarizing. I wish I could have called her back, you know, when I was making this decision to just explain that. Um, but, you know, once, once I did my research, the, the scientists in the medical community like did what needed to be done to approve a safe vaccine. Um, and even though it was relatively new, I also, so earlier it was mentioned that I'm a pediatrician, but I'm a pediatric emergency doctor. So mm. I work in the emergency room primarily, and I have seen what COVID-19 can do. I have seen people who are so sick. Um, I have seen how COVID-19 has completely changed the way that we care for patients. So usually we try to be very family centered. If there's someone who's really sick, have family at the bedside so that they can be comforted. If there's someone who's dying, to have family with them. And the issue with COVID-19 is not only does it make people really sick, but in addition to that, it mm -hmm. isolates them. We can't have family at the bedside. And so you can have someone dying and their family member has to, to look at them and, and talk to them over FaceTime on an iPad. And you know, it's so there, there's so many ways that COVID-19 has like really affected the way that our healthcare system works um, and really affected people and communities. 
And so as I thought about getting the vaccine, all of that was in my mind. And, and you know, once I did my research and had a better understanding of it, there was no question. And I literally just about skipped into the clinic to get the vaccine. <laughs> the nurse said, are you nervous? I said, no, Give, you know, took, took my mm-hmm. shoulder out, took selfies before and after with the nurse um, mm-hmm. and did that after the second vaccine as well. Um, and with the first one, I had a slightly sore arm and that's really it. With the second vaccine, I had about 24 hours of kind of chills, um, muscle aches, just didn't feel great, felt very tired. And it was, it, it really felt almost like I had the flu for about 24 hours. And I literally woke up the next day and felt like a new woman. Um, so it was a very um, kind of brief period. And it was unlike, you know, really being sick and that it just, it was quick on and then quick off and I was fine. So, um, you know, I, th- I think each of us, just depending on our bodies, have different experiences, but everyone that I've spoke with, spoken to who's had any side effects, it's usually very limited to a short period. Great. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Cole or Dr. Hampton? As an um, infectious disease physician, you know, immunizing and vaccines is our thing. So <laughs> always, I'm always reading studies about many different vaccines. So it wasn't any different for this. And I knew so many different people who were actually bench scientists who are part of it, you know, and different ones. And so you would get the updates about how things were going. So I, I, I wasn't ever really in doubt of, of um, was I going to do it or not? Because I ignored the Trump administration on all of that because I knew they were being stifled and um, a, a, a couple of people on those task force had been mentors of mine. And, and I, I guess I had a different outlook because as a infectious disease fellow, my research was with the HIV vaccine trials network. And so for about two years, I was a clinical trials physician enrolling people in um, phase one H, um, HIV candidate vaccines. And so being able to see it from that side and how much um, how much information that you had teaching that you do when you're enrolling people into clinical trials like this into vaccine trials and just how much information that you give people and especially when you're in play, um, explaining informed consent so they understand it perfectly and people repeat back to you what they understand and then you let them know that they can opt out of this at any point that they want to um, and you just find out how rigorous it is because you have institutions with their institutional review boards mm-hmm. and, 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 and um safety data monitoring boards who are are constantly peering over information. And so you are really following in this country, you are really following exactly how it's laid out and you're not deviating from it. And anytime there's an instance where somebody has a a, a bad reaction um, while they're in the trial, I mean, you're all over it and it's there and people are deciding whether or not they need to put a pause. So like, I think the summer you heard that there were instances where different vaccines were paused. And the reason was, I think that the um, the Oxford AstraZeneca uh, vaccine, which we don't have the emergency use authorization in this country, but over in the UK, they were, um, it had unmasked, meaning that when you put people in clinical trials in the very beginning, everybody is healthy. They don't have any health problems. They're absolutely not taking medications. And these people, there were two people who, um, developed uh, neurological symptoms. But what ended up happening was that both of them had autoimmune illnesses that were unmasked, what meaning that the, um, the, by being in that, and you know, we're trying to rev up your immune system when we're giving you a vaccine. And so in the process of doing that, they had both received the actual vaccine and then realized somebody had MS and somebody else had it, and it just hadn't been diagnosed yet. So once all of that got hashed out, they went through all of the data because you have to turn everything over and then they end up um, telling the people, okay, you're, we're unblinding you and letting you know that you were actually getting the vaccine and this is w- what's going on with it. You know, they hash that kind of stuff out and then they share that information you know, internationally. So everybody got to look at it. And when that happened, they paused it here in the United States. So, I mean, people were really, diligent about how safe things are. And, you know, the fact that I think that it was just so transparent at every step along the way, you can go on these manufacturing sites and obviously Moderna and Pfizer and Eli Lilly and Johnson, everybody has um, 
they, they want to make money, but they don't want to kill and maim people. So they got to, they, they really have to be transparent and honest about their information because otherwise there's, there's competition with it. I mean, there are three other vaccines right now outside of the two that we have that are emergency use that will be coming out of their phase three trials um, in the next couple of months. And some of these are just going to be a one-shot deal. They don't require being in the freezer. So you're going to be able to get it to places that are rural that had issues about, you know, distribution. Mm -hmm. So there's going to be some competition to this. So everybody wants to make sure that they're offering something that's good. What to me, I thought was just blew me away because I didn't think that we were going to have the, the safety data. And I did not think it was going to be as effective as it was. When you start talking about 94, 95% mm -hmm. effect, I mean, that's like getting to a measles vaccine. I mean, that's like the best. It's like 97, 98% out here. And the fact that you have that type of effect, that was great. Even if you had, with this concerns about some of these variants, the one in particular, the a strain of this that's coming out of South Africa, then people are concerned about whether or not you're gonna have to get a booster shot to, to kind of um, help the vaccine not escape this, that um, even with that, we're talking about if it was even lowered to 80 some percent, 70. I mean, that is still great coverage for people. I mean, that is still, I mean, you know, I think the media hypes everything up and it makes it alarmist and like, oh my gosh, it's not gonna be 94%. But we're talking, we're not talking about like it's gonna be 30 or 40% not effective. And, and quite honestly, if you look at how effective the flu vaccine is every mm. year, I mean, it's sometimes it is sitting at 35, 40 some odd percent, and we're still pushing people to go ahead and get it. Mm -hmm. Why? Because we know that the people are going to pass away from the flu. And even in the instance that maybe it's only 40% perfect effective, you're still going to save some lives. You're going to save people from having severe disease, or you're going to save them from having, you know, severe complications as a result of that. So I got my first uh, vaccine this past Monday. And let me tell you, I didn't sleep all night. I was so excited. I thought it was like Christmas. I could not wait, couldn't wait. I was 30 minutes early. They were like, excited. you are right. I had pulled my whole arm out. I was out here and ready for it. And I don't think I have ever been excited about getting a vaccine as much as I was excited about getting that. And I like, and you know, and they, I, I went to a drive up situation where it was pouring down rain, did all of that. They came out. And I was really impressed with how the Illinois Department of Public Health has really helped this state and local health departments, which are struggling because last 25 years, there's not been much funding going towards health departments, but they have really been on it and educating and stuff. And I was just excited about it. Now, I didn't feel well for 24 hours. I'm, and I've been very honest about that. Um, and I've never had issues with vaccines before, but I think with this, I already knew that, you know, I'm going to probably feel fluish and I had some joint aches for all of 24 hours. I woke up this morning and was like, like it had never happened. My arms not even sore. So I have just been telling patients, I'm just going to tell you with the type of immune response we're, we're doing with this and the fact that like there's no innate immunity that we have to this, that mm -hmm. if you have a strong reaction to this, some of that is a good thing because that's letting us know your body is responding and it is saying, okay, I can respond to something that's foreign. And that's what we want. And that you just have to recognize that, you know, 24 to 48 hours of some temporary discomfort, please take that. You know, and, and so I'm always very honest that even with any vaccine, even with influenza, that you might not feel well after it, but it's temporary. And then the temporariness of that far outweighs what we know what's going on with this, with this virus. I guess I'll, I'll chime in real quick. Um, you know, um, it was really, I did the same thing my colleague did. I did a lot of research. I had some uh, apprehension, but not a lot uh, because like my infectious disease colleagues, you know, this is kind of like the world we live in. So didn't have to talk me into it. Uh, but I, I will say this, um, we had doctors who cried the day they got their vaccine. They were that excited. Um, and I, you know, to be honest with you, some of those doctors who cry work in a hospital and they are literally uh, watching people leave every day. Um, and, if, and literally today I had a family member 
uh, actually a friend of the family call and we and they were asking me what should they do and they had a family member who uh, they were deciding about taking them off the vent or not so we had that conversation today so I think we're tired 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 of that I've signed more death certificates in 2020 than in my career you know it's been ridiculous so so for me I love to travel uh, I've missed you know I've had a couple of virtual conferences trying to teach my low carb message and I want to do that in person you know I want to get back to that um, and and to be honest with you even for the, anybody listening uh, who would think that we're different than you we're not different rather it's the history we shared or the fears we have about things like new vaccines but what I will because in within our health system at Advocate Aurora half the nurses were saying not sure about it and these are healthcare professionals. And, and I think those numbers are starting to change, but it's okay to be afraid because our nurses were afraid. It's, we had better numbers with our docs and advanced practice nurses, but at the end of the day, people were afraid. So, so for me, and let me just tell you what I tell my patients, you know, I say, we have a choice. So, you know, if I'm sitting at home and I'm worried about somebody coming in to harm me, and let's just say that's the virus, I'm sitting at the table with my T fighter cells, my T helper cells, and they're going to do a good job if I'm a healthy person to help me fight. But wouldn't, wouldn't it be nice if we had somebody outside the house ready to fight the fight for us right now? In other words, those antibodies that you get from this vaccination is like having people outside your house with the guns cocked with a laser on it that are designed to kill this particular vaccine, this organism. So that's what a vaccine will do. Instead of waiting for somebody to knock your door down and praying that the immune system will respond, you'll have people outside doing so much damage that you may not even know you've been exposed to it. Mm -hmm. But that's the beauty of a vaccine. It really just prepares your body to fight the war in advance. And I think for anybody listening, if you're afraid of this virus, be more afraid of the virus than of the vaccine because the impact on your life, the vaccine will have. And for me, it was just a sore arm. I, I called my mom and my mom was worried. Are you okay? You're not moms are, especially for the, shout out to all the ladies on the panel. <laughs> you guys really know how to protect your nest, right? So my mom, I told mom, I'm fine. I don't feel anything, you know? And then that night I woke up and I felt the sore arm, right? And the next day my arm was sore. The third day I didn't feel anything. I was fortunate I didn't have any other symptoms. So, so for, in fact, when I talked to my colleagues, most of them have not had, it seems like the sore arm is universal, but the other symptoms are hit or miss, but we have not, we vaccinated 50,000 people in our health system at Advocate Aurora, and we just haven't had any big problems. In fact, that's our own independent study right there. So uh, trust me, guys, millions of people are being vaccinated. And if there's a problem with this vaccine, it's going to be on the news tonight, trust me. So just like a plane, when a plane falls, everybody learns of it. If people are having, so if you haven't heard a lot in the news about it, that's a very good sign. So. All right, I think we've got, I think uh, Reverend Tracy might have a question for this panel as well. And then we want to uh, make sure that we get to the questions uh, because we have a number of them uh, as expected that have come in tonight. And we wanna make sure we get to as many of those as possible um, before our time ends at 7.30. So Dr. Gibson. Yes. Well, thank you so much for your insights. Thank you for sharing with the audience and I'm learning as well. But I wanna to talk to you about forward thinking and implications of not taking the virus or the vaccine. And many of you have already spoken about that. I wanna um, hear your perspectives on the digital divide and what gives you hope after you've had this conversation with your patients, with your friends and other family members, what gives you hope and what are you deeply concerned about? So I guess I can start it off. Um, one of the things that gives me hope is that people are tuning into panels just like this to get to become well-informed and they're doing their due diligence to find out the information and to make that decision and asking those questions so they can have the answers to feel comfortable with taking the vaccine. Um, one of the things that I'm concerned about and that I'm hoping will change is that we start, we change the narrative that it's not the black and brown communities that are afraid of the vaccine, 
but we're just not having the resources to receive the vaccine in our communities. So then there could be a focus on making sure, just like it was at the beginning of the pandemic, to make sure that we had testing facilities in our communities, the communities that were the most impacted by the, the virus, the same thing needs to be done with the vaccine distribution. We need vaccines to be distributed in the communities that are the most affected by it. And so by showing the rest of the world that we're black and brown and we're not afraid of this vaccine, um, but we are afraid of the virus, um, then maybe they'll start putting the vaccines in our communities more. And then we can change the, the fight that we have from informing people about the vaccine to now uh, letting the world know that we're ready to receive it and getting those resources. Yeah. And I'll just add, you know, you mentioned the digital divide. And I think that's another issue that, you know, many, many cities are, um, placing, like they have websites where you have to go on to sign up. And what's happening is if you're not on your computer, literally refreshing the screen to get your spot for the vaccine, then you miss out. And what that means is that someone who's working a job or they can't just step away and get on the computer, you know, someone who doesn't have uh, high speed internet or who has high speed internet, but they also have three kids who are home trying to do virtual school on Zoom and you know their internet connection is very slow. I mean, I think those are that the systemic issues that Dr. Lane was mentioning that we need to work on. Because yeah, hesitancy is one thing, but the other thing is these structural issues, like how we get people to sign up for the vaccine, where the vaccine is being offered. If it's only being offered in certain places where someone had to take three buses you know, to get there to get the vaccine, it's going to be much harder. And, and that person is much less likely to get it, especially if they're, again, working a job or they don't have the ability to leave for two hours to take the three buses to get the vaccine and come back to work when they don't have the ability to take a day off because they're not feeling great for the next day after the vaccine. So I think there, there are additional issues that, again, like we really have to address on a structural level so that people can, if, if they're open to it, they can actually get the vaccine. Thank you so much for that, because I also think about our seniors who don't even have the capacity with the computer um, and that digital divide is also there. Others of you, please share. Um, what gives, oh, go, ahead. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. Go ahead. Dr. Thornton. Okay. You... I think what gives me hope is that as opposed to the prior four years, we now have an administration politically that sees the value in public health, that understands the value of truth and dissemination of correct information, that sees and places dollars in the public health sector to make this vaccine available. What gives me hope are leaders of faith, such as you all. Um, we all know that in times of trouble, people of color look to our faith institutions and our leaders of faith. And, and I would just at this point charge you all with potentially getting out there with your public health and local leaders to make sure that your communities are getting their percentages that are correct of the vaccine that, you know, this is great, I appreciate this form. Now we have to take it to the next level and accessibility, after information comes accessibility. And, and until we can have ex access to all the vital parts of healthcare, we're still going to be uh, marginalized communities. So you as leaders of faith, I, I would hope that you all can put pressure on your public health officials, your city and state and county officials to make sure that their late vaccine uh, access place for people who work 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., who don't have to take the two buses as a mile the doctor just mentioned. And lastly, we talked about the digital divide and you know, I'm kind of torn on that. I I've seen, you know, I'm a Facebooker, I've done TikTok, I've been on, I even joined Parlor because I wanted to see what the other side was saying. And yes, for our elderly, they may not be as digitally adept, but my biggest concern is the naysayers and the false information being disseminated amongst our youth. Mm -hmm. They have access to, to all of this information, Dr. Cole and my colleagues have said. They know how to stream, they know how to do everything, but they've chosen somehow, it's almost like trying to get them to vote. I don't know what we're going to have to do 
to eradicate this cabal of disinformation amongst our youth. I, I don't understand why they don't, as we did growing up, hold in higher esteem our faith leaders, our educated physicians, scientists, and, and health officials. I, and I don't know what to do about that. And the last thing I just want to interject is I don't think we've touched upon this is I am really concerned about the psychological fallout that this pandemic has had on our communities. Um, we look at the isolation, we look at the death, the death without mourning. And that's something that faith leaders, you all know are very well, you know, we've not been able to mourn our, our lost ones. We've not been able to comfort them when they were sick. We've not been able to bury them in our traditional manners. You know, funerals are big in the black community. And that is a sense of loss when people can't have their loved ones. I had to postpone a daughter's wedding. So there's a psychological aspect to this that, that while we're talking about the death and destruction of COVID, let's not forget that the mind is a part of our health structure as well. And I think, you know, we really need to start talking and looking long term. We've talked about long haulers with COVID in terms of the physical aspects, but I think there's going to be a severe psychological and psychiatric fallout too. Yeah, I'm going to chime in on the behavioral health, mental health aspect. I knew probably this late spring, um, even though I'm an infectious disease uh, specialist, I, I do some internal medicine, a bunch of my colleagues I take care of. And when I started getting a whole bunch of telehealth appointments from my own colleagues, and when I was just listening to them, it was really a counseling session. And a lot of it was grief and, um, post-traumatic distress from having gone and worked in New York and coming back to Detroit and just seeing death and dying every single day and not having time off and um, having to deal with anger and did I do enough, uh, a lot of grief things. And, and, and then in my taking care of them, realized I need to take care of myself. Like I might go back into therapy, like, okay, I got a dump today. So listen, <laughs> because I mean, and I think that the, the idea that you are in therapy for black folks is just like, we don't mm -hmm. talk about that, you know, because that's a bad thing. But with this, I don't know how people can escape this because the psychological effects of this are gonna be here long after we've conquered this whole thing and we are regularly getting immunized for this, which is probably what's gonna end up happening. And my, my thing is that I always think of, you know, for the people that are sitting up and listening to the fact by virtue of their ethnicity or their race or their ancestry, that the likelihood that if they get COVID, that they're not gonna do well and having to hear those statistics over and over because they're true. But what does that do for you? I think some mm -hmm. people have absolutely taken this whole, that's not that that's not gonna happen to me. I'm not even concerned about that. And there's a lot of denialism. And of course, this last administration really set that up where you know, you're having to have these political battles about something that is not political. I never thought that I would be arguing with people about a 10 second thing to put a mask over your nose and your mouth. I mean, I just, you know, especially when you start looking at all these other countries that are, um, that, that, that they look out for self and neighbor as thyself. And so they're wearing masks. And, I, and in our country, it was, you know, you have people using God by saying, um, you know what, you're afraid. And if you are covered in the blood, you will not have to wear the mask. And I would be thinking, who told you that? Who said that? <laughs> where is that? Where is the red print in the Bible that said that? Christ did not say that. So, you know, the fact that you have a, you know, have to listen to these people saying these things, talk about what God are you serving? Because last time I checked, I thought what I had gotten were some gifts. And so I'm sharing my gifts and this is what I'm telling you. So you need to make those decisions. But you're absolutely right, uh, Verna, when you're talking about young people and the stuff they do, a lot, I think a lot of it is because they are so connected to the internet and they are using social media as their credible source of news, which is horrible because, you know, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter and all those things will feed you what you are into and 
because this disease has been so isolating, not just for people that have it, but folks who are trying not to have it, we're all at home and we're all trying to use it, either our smartphone or we're trying to use an online or we're on the telephone and you're, and you tend to feed off of one another about, about what you're hearing. I think I have done so many talks on myths within mm -hmm. our community. I'm still doing, still doing myth talks. I, my first myth talk was in Mar March 12th of last year. I am still doing myth talks. And that lets me know that there's this active um, cabal of information, that disinformation and just wrong stuff that are out there. You mentioned Dr. Sebi, all I could do was just nod. Because I'm not trying to, I don't even have those arguments with people anymore, you know what I'm saying? Like if you want a double mega dose with yourself with elderberry syrup and vitamin C and all that and turmeric and everything, I'm going to say, go have at it. But I'm going to tell you right now, there's not a study yet that has said mm -hmm. anything that's going to prevent you from getting this virus. And no, it's not going to be transmitted through 5G. I don't care what you saw on the internet. That's just not how viruses are done. So I feel like that is a constant battle that we are constantly having over and over. And you would think like, man, okay, where are people, where are they at? Where they not listen to that? Like, I, I honestly did not think a year from now that we would still be combating you know, if I just swish my mouth with Vito's vodka, any virus that got in my throat is going to be killed and gone. What? It be, but those are real things and mm -hmm. people pass those along. Well, I'll just add a couple of quick comments so we can, I know we have to move on to the next part of this, but just first of all, thank you, Dr. Cole, for entertaining us tonight. I really, <laughs> I'm thoroughly enjoying this. So, but uh, but I do want to just say really quickly. I know in our health system we started with apps, and I did get a little nervous about that as well because I knew a lot of my seniors couldn't. Uh, you know, I think they can and they can't. I do virtual visits often, and I will do 25 virtual visits on a day. And yes, my seniors, whether they got help or not, they do fine. However, uh, you know, it's frustrating that we would have to depend on that technology. So thankfully, my health system, they do call people. They do, uh, you know, you know, you have to email people, call people, app people, whatever it takes and, and market uh, to the public. So I'm really excited about the fact that they are thinking in a diverse manner. And, uh, and I think that's a good thing. I also think we have to think outside the box and maybe things like home health, they should be doing vaccinations. Uh, we should have Ooh. mobile units going into communities of color and making sure people have access. So as we, we need to have access to more vaccine, but as the supplies build up, uh, I think that'll help. The things that I'm hopeful for, number one, is a lot of my patients have been depressed as we've stated, but you know what, virtual technology is wonderful and our behavioral health teams are doing a lot of virtual visits. So in some ways they're reaching more people than they had reached previously to this. And none of us knew how to do all of this stuff a year ago and now we all do. So that makes me hopeful. And then the other thing is, um, I, I'm actually, we have a new administration which will likely do a much better job, but we also have a part of that uh, administration and that culture that's pushing that party away from lobbyists and special interests, but towards the needs of the people. And what we really need is to get more people like that who maybe raise money from people instead of lobbyists and special interests elected so that they can then actually represent the people. It's impossible to represent the people and the needs of the people if you have favors to, uh, you have to live up to. So I think I'm excited about that. And I think that we're gonna have a future. And, and, and if anybody's listening who, thinks that there's no power in the individual. Think about Reddit, Reddit, if I'm pronouncing it right, what that company did when they uh, raised hell at, with Wall Street, excuse my French uh, pastor. But, <laughs> um, but just imagine what all of those people did when they decided to buy the stock of uh, you know, the companies that they purchased. And that's, what, that's the power and people never give up your power. You have all the power you need. Mm -hmm. You just need to have something you believe in and that you wanna fight for. Thank you all for sharing. And I'm going to turn it over to um, Reverend Brazier and Reverend Blunt to go through some of the questions and answers that we've gotten through the chat. Awesome. Thank you, uh, Dr. Gibson. Uh, at this time, uh, we have a number of questions. And what I thought would be a good idea is as we throw the question out, because we have so many of them, we got quite a few, that if we can maybe have one person take that question respond to it and then we'll move on to the next uh, so that we can get through as many of these questions as possible. 
Uh, one of the questions that was asked that I would like to uh, uh, place out there is, um, and this was uh, a question a person had, they're a dialysis patient. Uh, should they take the vaccine? And are there any reported side effects uh, for persons who are already on dialysis? If, if I could just add to that question, because there were several related questions like that in the chat. So in addition to dialysis, are there any other underlying conditions that you all are aware of? Um, and I know that the, because we're so new into this vaccine that there hasn't been a lot of long-term uh, data, but are there any underlying conditions um, along with dialysis, uh, high blood pressure, things of that nature, uh, any other autoimmune issues that would preclude somebody from getting the vaccine? Dr. Cole, I don't know if you were gonna right. answer that. <laughs> yeah, I saw, her, I saw her getting excited. Well, yes, no, she got no. to up. <laughs> Mine was rolling. No, 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 no. Actually, those are um, dialysis patients, people with high blood pressure. I mean, people who have um, uh, chronic health problems, whether they're controlled or uncontrolled. I mean, those are the folks that we consider high risk. I mean, we're trying to protect you, you know, that we definitely want um, you to get that. We've not had, I mean, and I think I've looked at safety data for us, too many of them, and I don't see any outstanding group. I mean, even down to, you know, people would think about pregnant women, but, but uh, Dr. Lane had already, you know, dispelled that. And that's the truth because these have been really some safe set of vaccines. Like I, I, you know, people say, well, you know, Hank Aaron got this two weeks ago and then he died. And I had to say, but he, well, then he was 84 and he wasn't in great health to begin with. It had nothing to do with the vaccine. And you know, when you are explaining to people that normally if you're gonna have a very bad reaction to a vaccine, it's gonna be within the first 15, 30 minutes. If delayed up to four hours, delayed. But anything beyond that, no. And every single person we've given out maybe what, 5 million of the Moderna vaccine, they've had 10 anaphylactic issues where people had to get Benadryl and steroids and all that. And all 10 of those people lived and they have gone on to get their second dose. So we're talking about some really, you know, safe vaccines. And I would just say, if you are uptight about that, that you should be trying to, you know, connect with your primary care, and, and hash out what your concerns are. These mRNA vaccines, I'll tell you, they have water, sugars, and they have the genetic directions that's wrapped around a bunch of fat layer that protects it when you get shot in there. And then that mRNA genetic message, after it gives the directions to your cells, it disappears like a Snapchat photo. So what's in this, this, these vaccines, it's like bare bones. It's not like when you're looking at some of these other vaccines that have a whole bunch of preservatives and stuff. That's why I'm saying that, you know, you might have some discomfort with this that's temporary, but in terms of what's going into you, these are some of the more plain, straightforward contents. And you can go to every manufacturer's website and you can see what is listed in there. I think you just renamed this the Snapchat vaccine. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> I love that analogy. Absolutely loved it. One of the next questions that uh, kind of ties into it, uh, somebody here, I thought it was a great question. Can you mix vaccines? Because uh, Dr. Cole, you mentioned uh, the Moderna, the Pfizer vaccine, and we know those are the two that are out there. But the person asked, can you mix vaccines? So for example, if you have Pfizer, but on your second shot, Moderna is the only thing that's available. Uh, should you wait for the Pfizer vaccine to become available to take that as your second shot or how does that work? I guess I'll, I'll just chime yeah, in real okay. quick. Yeah, just this is real easy actually. <laughs> no, <laughs> that's the simple answer. <laughs> so you don't want to mix vaccines. Uh, not that we don't think that it'll work, but we need data, right? So if we're not doing mixing in our studies, then we're not going to use you as a lab rat and use you as that study. So it's best to go with what we know. And that way we can get to our 90 and 95% effectiveness. Now, when it comes to you know, what vaccine, you get the one that you can get. That's my theory. You know, if you get Pfizer in your community, get that. If it's Moderna, when AstraZeneca gets approved, when Johnson & Johnson. And I love uh, AstraZeneca because it's cheaper. It's going to reach more people. It's not going to, it's not made as uh, Dr. Cole has suggested with the, 
you know, the sugar to water and the messenger RNA and the lipid bilayer, it has, it's made differently, but you don't have to keep it cold. And by the way, you have to keep it frozen because you're trying to preserve something that doesn't have preservatives in it. So if you're worried about preservatives, don't worry about that. I would get the vaccine that's available. I don't care if they come out with AstraZeneca and it only says 70 to 80%, who cares? You're gonna be way safer than you were before you took the vaccine. And that's the message that I send to my patients. Whatever's available, you take it. And thankfully, more people will have access as more uh, vaccines get approved. Awesome, thank you. Dr. Blunt, I'll turn it over to you for the next uh, few questions. Thank you, sir. And we got you on mute there, Dr. Blunt. Thank you. One question uh, that's been raised is uh, concern, how long will the vaccine last? Um, and, and we may not, we, and, the, and the answer may be, we don't know just yet, but, um, and maybe that's again to you, Dr. Cole, <laughs> uh, what, 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 what are folks saying about uh, how long will it last? When, when is it gonna be yearly like the uh, flu vi vaccine that we're gonna have to you know, do that on a regular basis? What do you, what, well, what are your thoughts? Everything that, that I've been hearing and, um, and that the calls that I've been on, cause we've been talking, you know, the, the whole idea of having, getting immunity is a, is the, is still the big question mark. And, you know, when you, when you're given a vaccine, what you're trying to do is you're trying to mimic the immunity of if you got the virus and you resolved it and your body healed naturally. So, I mean, that's what we're really trying to, you know, to give to people and, you know, there's always this discussion about whether or not if you get it naturally in your antibodies, how long are they lasting? You know, in their cases of it's two weeks to some people to six months, and we still don't have it down yet about what's the exact timing. I don't think we know that. And, and, and in, the, in the same right, I don't think we know that, you know, for these vaccines, but the, the, the discussion has been that we, and, and I think it's illustrated with these strains that are coming along, very much like influenza, you know, when you get an influenza shot every year, it's a number of different strains that were circulating and a problem across the world the last year. I think that's what's probably going to end up happening for this once everybody has gone through and got immunized. And if we find that these variants are more will, all, you know, some of us won't require a booster shot to be able to, to cover those. So this might, from at least what the bench scientists are saying, is they think that this might be something that we're getting every year at least with what how these first sets of vaccines and the ones that are coming closer to coming out of the pipeline are looking and and honestly and I tell people but that's okay you know that but that's okay because we it's not like that that means it does not work it just means that you know we are we need to make sure that we kind of make adjustments to it which we can and we have the technology to safely do that um, whether we do that every year so it's still in a process and i think that as more data comes out we'll have better answers about that probably by the summer but nothing definite yet thank you and this question is uh, uh directed toward uh, dr kendi do you foresee a future where the vaccine will become mandatory scheduled immunization for kids to enter or attend school? See that at some point in the future. I mean, right now, because it's under emergency use authorization, I don't see that that would be the case right now. But I think once it's fully approved by the FDA um, and no longer under emergency use authorization, once it's approved for use in children, um, I could see it being similar to the flu shot. You know, there are some school systems that require the flu vaccine um, to be in school, and I could see the COVID vaccine um, kind of going along with that, and that would make perfect sense to me to keep the kids safe and keep them in school. Yeah. Great. Dr. Brazier? <laughs> You're muted too. <laughs> yeah, now I'm muted. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I think our Reverend Robinson, uh, you mentioned you had a question for uh, the panelists of, uh, for Pete. Uh, well, that was that Dr. Blunt just took that question. That was the question I was going to ask, but I do have another question. Um, and it gets to uh, some research and studies that demonstrate uh, that while Black people in general are more likely uh, to take this, vac this, this virus seriously, uh, more likely to engage in the preventative measures such as wearing masks um, and so on, 
that we are also less likely to be getting a vaccine. Um, I just read a story yesterday about how um, our initial participation in this vaccine uh, is woefully behind that of other communities. So we're not getting access. And so we've kind of talked about that a little bit, but I'm wondering, I don't know who to throw this out to, but whoever wants to field it, what can we do to, how do we put pressure, not only put pressure on the public health folks, as Dr. Thornton uh, referenced, but how do we begin to close that gap of participation? I think one of the answers is accessibility. I think um, Dr. Thornton mentioned accessibility before, and I really think we should be offering the vaccines in our churches. We should be offering the vaccine in community centers. Like we should have the vaccine in the places where our people go um, and not make the people go to some new place that's far away to get the vaccine. And I think that's what we should be pushing for. So, so with you. that, let me uh, uh, um, follow up. Who would you suggest um, uh, leaders like faith leaders and others to contact to uh, strongly encourage them to use our sites as a, as a place to be able to um, provide vaccines? Who, would, who should we contact? I would think the local Department of Health would probably be the first um, step. And I think like any of us doctors that are in your local area can kind of help with identifying who at the, the Department of Health you would contact. But I think mm -hmm. that would be the first step because they're currently as more vaccine is becoming available, you know, cities and locales are coming up with their plan for distribution mm -hmm. and um, getting involved as early as possible in that planning, I think is really important. I'd like to interject. Um, I think we have to be strategic about this and hit the ground running. Um, it's just like Stacey Abrams did the impossible in Georgia with getting two senators elected on the Democratic ticket. Same thing with this vaccine. We need to start mobilizing and getting people such as start with your city council or alder people. Go to your state senator, your state congressman. You need to lobby upon them because again, even if you open up your churches, you got to have the vaccine. And you've got to have the people who are trained in case there is a reaction at your site. You're not a hospital. So we need to, one, make sure that our communities are not left behind with regard to the access. Um, you probably have heard the story about the couple who was multimillionaires in Canada who drove to an indigenous community and lied about being a part of that community to get the vaccine. And they were fined, what, $500 a piece, which is nothing if, you're, if you've got a private plane. So, I mean, we, we've got to protect our communities and we start that by, you know, from the ground up, using your local political leaders you know, and let them know this is a priority for your communities. I want you guys to make sure we get X amount of vaccines for this county, this parish, this city, this county, you know, whatever. And then, of course, have it set up. And it's a win-win because, see, one of the things you know about politicians, they want to be remembered for everything they did so they can get votes the next go round. So again, it's called leveraging your power. Now, forget who it was talking about again about our power. We have more power than we wish to recognize. Leverage your power by getting your politicians to get it in your communities. That way we don't have to really worry about going over. Because let me tell you something, you already see half of the Republican Party, and I'm not trying to be partisan, I'm just stating facts. They called it a hoax, but they're the very first ones getting the vaccine with their sleeves rolled up. <laughs> OK, so that's power. We have that same power. We just tend to have a wait around and see what happens attitude. No, this is not a time to wait around. It's time to get up and get going. So many of us uh, use uh, community based health centers and federally qualified health care centers. And, uh, you know, they always need you know, um, partnerships because so many of us who are underinsured or um, have no insurance are using these. And um, since this pandemic has straightened, and the ones, these community-based health centers that are not um, tapped into the government, so they're not federally qualified, a lot of them are struggling. So that they are 
really critical in how they reach the masses. And usually they are in areas that are pretty strategic that people can get to either by bus or they can walk or they can um, ride a bike or the, there's, a, there's the train system. And I think because we now know that there's so many of these community-based health centers that are in, are in trouble just because of how the nature of this pandemic has been, you know, reaching out to them and it will, I think be really strategic for us in addition to just churches, because some of these places can also be used for testing as well as for giving out vaccines. And in many states, they are allowing, you know, medical students, um, um, pharmacy students, they're allowing nursing students to participate and residents to give out shots. They're, they're, there's too many students out here in the medical field and allied health that, that can be a part of this and that we, that we need to tap into. Great. Awesome. Um, Thank you. If I could just jump in for a second here, I, I saw a couple of questions that I like to have our doctors respond to. One question that came up was, is there a waiting period after having COVID that you still need to wait before you get the vaccine. And there was some other question about um, once you get it, can you get it again? Yes, you can get it again. <laughs> I've had too many patients who've gotten it again and they were shocked each time. And no, there's no way to be able to tell if you had it and it was real mild the first time and then you got it the second time. Is it going to be the same or worse? There's, I mean, we don't have data that shows that, but yes, you can get it again. Well, what was the other part of that question? The other part of the question is, once you have it, do you need to wait a certain period of time before getting vaccinated? Um, so, you know, it, I guess it depends on the institution because some institutions are coming up with guidelines and they're saying 90 days and then you can get it. But I also know that there are some institutions who are not. They are saying a couple weeks out, you're good. Let's get you, you need it, you need it, you need it. So I think there's some variability to that. And I haven't seen a good data set yet that says this is the definite guideline and that all the peers have looked on it and agreed. I would just say that, you know, who, you, talking to your, your provider, your, your primary provider and saying that, yes, just because you've had it does not necessarily mean you don't need to go ahead and get a vaccination at some point. You do. Um, it's just the timing of it. And a lot of that is going to depend on the, the institution that's giving it out. And I think that you just need to be thinking in your mind that yes, I'm, I'm gonna get this, this vaccination even though I've had it at some point. And for our OBGYNs on the uh, call, uh, question came in, if the mom tests positive for COVID during delivery, is there any evidence to suggest that the baby uh, has COVID too? So um, a very direct answer to that question is right now, no. And so it's just expanded outside of delivery. If a mom, if a woman is pregnant and she um, contracts COVID-19 virus, there has uh, been no direct evidence that she's gonna pass it on to her baby. The medical term for that is called vertical transmission. So while the baby is still in the womb, the mom passes the virus to the baby. There have been a handful of cases around the world of potentially this happening. But when they looked deeper into those scenarios, they weren't certain if the baby got exposed after delivery or if it was while the baby was in the womb. So the, the answer that we have right now is no, there's no evidence that a pregnant mother can pass the virus to her baby while she's pregnant. Um, or while she's delivering the baby. Um, but she can pass it around to the healthcare workers in the room and her support people in the room. And that's why it was so important for everyone to be vaccinated. And while we're on that topic of moms and babies, I just wanna also add that moms who have the virus or who have recently had the virus or moms that have had the vaccine 
all of those women can all breastfeed their babies. Mm -hmm. There's been no evidence of the COVID-19 virus um, being passed and spread to babies through breast milk. And so it's safe to breastfeed your baby. That's what we recommend moms to do. Uh, but we just recommend moms to wear a mask uh, to decrease the risk of transmission um, with the baby just being close to them while they're breastfeeding. Uh, but we highly recommend breastfeeding for women who are pregnant, um, who have just had their babies who have had the virus. I'd also like to add to make sure that you aren't told that you have to have a C-section just because you have COVID as well. Uh, cesarean section should be limited for either maternal or obstetrical reasons only, uh, not because you have COVID. So just don't want women to start getting, having oper operations and for their deliveries that are unjustified. So just throwing that out there for public knowledge. Thanks, Dr. Thornton. And one more thing, you made me remember another important message I want to make sure everyone listening hears is that as even though we're in the middle of a pandemic um, and some people feel that it's not safe to be around sick people, meaning a hospital setting, um, some women are going to deliver their babies at home, thinking that home births are safe. Are safer, better uh, environment for their, for their deliveries. And that's not the case. Uh, home deliveries are still very risky. And if something does go wrong, which can happen for anyone in labor and delivery, we want to be able to quickly help the moms and the babies out. And you can't do that if you're at home and your drive to the hospital is more than eight minutes. And so, and that's for pretty much everyone. And so we recommend that women who are pregnant go to their prenatal appointments, establish care with an obstetrical provider so they can get the care that they need, ask questions to the health expert at those appointments, and then make sure that you have a safe, healthy delivery in a hospital setting where we can take care of you and the baby. I just want to add to that PSA that Dr. Lane just gave uh, for children. One of the things that we're seeing is children missing their routine vaccinations because of the same, you know, families being worried about being exposed. And w the worry is that we're going to end up with a measles epidemic or some other serious epidemic in children because of children missing their vaccines. And so I would just echo what Dr. Lane said when it comes to kids. So there's certain appointments that is fine to do by telemedicine, but when the child is due for vaccines, check in with your pediatrician and talk to them about how you can safely come into the office. You know, do a first morning appointment, make sure that you're wearing your mask when you come in. Um, many pediatrician offices have made um, have made adjustments to ensure that there are not a lot of patients sitting in the waiting room. They make sure that people are not coming in close contact, but that is really important because I think we've all talked about the long-term effects of COVID-19, but one of them is potentially another pandemic of an even more deadly illness for children because of children not getting vaccinated. Awesome. Uh, if I could just throw out one last question. I know that we have focused, um, on the, the extreme importance of folk getting vaccinated and figuring out how we can do that better. But with all of you wonderful esteemed doctors on here, I would not want us to leave without you saying just something very quickly, uh, given the fact that uh, black and brown people have so many pre-existing conditions that make them much more vulnerable to the virus, how can black folk do a better job of taking care of themselves? I'll, I'll start the conversation and um, I, I, you know, that's kind of my- uh, This so, is area. Yeah, so I, I just want to keep it simple. I, when I came up with this NEST acronym, you know, it really was about nutrition first. So, you know, rather you're doing a Dr. Terry Mason and you're vegan, or you're doing a Dr. Tony Hampton, you're doing a low carb, avoiding sugar and starch, uh, that'll help you. I, I also want people to be comfortable with intermittent fasting. So you don't have to always eat, you know, it's okay to take a break. I usually don't start eating until noon most days. And when you eat this way, you don't really get hungry because your body becomes adaptive. The E in the nest is for exercise. So, um, you know, literally, uh, you know, last night I was supposed to exercise. I forgot. I was in the shower. I got out of the shower and I did exercise in the bathroom because that's what I do. So you got to get to the point where that's what you do. And every other day or so, you should find a way to move your body. 
You got to learn to reduce your stress. I don't watch the news. If, if something happened yesterday, I wouldn't even know because I don't put that garbage in my head. Uh, I get my sleep. Uh, nobody can touch me after about 10 p.m. I'm just putting it out there. I get my sleep and that's what I do. And then it, <laughs> and the T is for how we think. And I think it's important that we constantly put positive things in our brain. And that way, not just avoiding pos uh, negative, you have to put positive. So rather it's uh, Les Brown or Eric Thomas, the hip hop preacher, put something in your head that will uh, protect you. And if you do both physical and, uh, uh, you know, and emotional, I think you'll be in much better shape. Anybody else just a quick thought on that? I'll, I'll just add this. Um, they've done some studies already for women's health, and it's shown that this pandemic alone is going to cause huge delays in diagnosis of some serious things such as cancer because of the slowdowns of offices and the practices in the hospital setting. And I just want to urge my you know, ladies out there as well as men, this is still, even though we have a raging pandemic, it is do not neglect your maintenance on your health. Please get your mammograms, get your PAPs, get your prostate check, get your colonoscopies. Because once again, we are dying and affected, you know, disproportionately due to COVID. We also are being affected and dying disproportionately from all the other stuff that existed prior to this pandemic. So please don't delay because delay can mean death. And I'll just add that every month in the world over a million people have a heart attack or some type of form of heart disease a million people 17 million people per year die from heart related disease so think think about those pandemic numbers and that's and that's what my message to people is the real pandemic is a pandemic of chronic disease and we need to take that seriously and if we do these lifestyle changes you will not have to have those chronic diseases I'll just add that, you know, we've talked a lot about um, people's behaviors, but I even like to go further upstream to social determinants of health. And that's where policy comes in. Yeah. So policies around a higher minimum wage so that people can afford food. Food insecurity is a huge issue right now during the pandemic. It was an issue before the pandemic. It's even more of an issue now. You know, making sure that people aren't getting evicted, you know, housing insecurity, being homeless are huge um, risks to people's health. And so I think supporting policies that support families is the other way we can really take care of ourselves. Because, you know, we can talk about behavior all day and what you should eat and what you should do. But if you're not sure if you're going to have a, a roof over your head the next day, if you're not making enough in your minimum wage to be able to get a healthy meal for your family, then it's really, really hard to take good care of yourself. So I'm happy we have a new administration in place, but I think we still have to push even for local policies, because honestly, the local policies are, are just as important mm -hmm. as the federal policies and pushing for those local policies to really support um, our families so that people can do the things. Because I think most people want to do what they need to do to take care of themselves and their families, but we need to we need to support policies to help them be able to do that. So, thank you all, Dr. Brazier. I was getting wrapped up in the responses and enjoying <laughs> myself. <laughs> so uh, we are at. The uh, questions that did remain, a lot of them I think we have touched on um, because a lot of them were interrelated questions that came up during the uh, general conversation. On behalf of uh, my uh, uh, colleagues in the pastorate, uh, we just want to thank each of you uh, for joining with us tonight. Uh, I was surely blessed and I know everyone on here was. We're seeing the comments roll in about uh, how uh, blessed people were by this presentation. So we thank each of you uh, for spending time with us uh, tonight. I think one of our primary goals uh, as uh, pastors was to make sure that our, the people uh, in our congregations and those that attended this session left here feeling informed uh, because we make a lot of decisions a lot of times out of ignorance and that's not a negative thing, it's just that we don't know. And so we wanted to make sure that as pastors, we provided a forum uh, for persons to uh, hear the facts 
um, and not only hear the facts, but quite honestly, hear the facts from folks who look just like us. And so uh, we appreciate each of you uh, joining this evening. And uh, thank you again uh, from the bottom of our hearts uh, for the time and expertise uh, that you have shared with us. God bless each of you. And uh, to those of you who attended, uh, uh, whether it be uh, directly via the Zoom or via Facebook Live, we appreciate you as well. Uh, God bless and everyone have a wonderful evening. God bless. Thank bless. you, everybody. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks. Thanks again. Thank you. Bye-bye. People are asking how they can get the recording. So great question. The recording will be available. Uh, I'm going to um, make a couple edits to the beginning uh, because our um, our uh, test session where we were all logged in is part of that recording. Uh, so I'll uh, edit. <laughs> Nothing to be worried about. It was all good. <laughs> uh, but uh, I will uh, edit that piece out and then it will be posted on the uh, I actually put it in the chat. Uh, for all the participants that will be posted on the uh, Canaan AME or Canaan Church website. Uh, we'll also send out send it out where um, the pastors uh, who are on with us tonight will be able to share it via their uh, uh, church communications as well. Awesome. All Let's right. Thanks again. Thanks, everyone. Have a good night. Take Come care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.